Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily read. You all saw the thumbnail, you all saw the title slide. We're going to be talking about how Meld works today. This is a really cool mechanic, but there's also a lot of stuff that's not super intuitive about how it works. So I'm going to be going through all of the stuff that I think is important to know if you're going to be playing cards with Meld from this new set. Ready? Let's get started. So basically, we're going to start out at the very beginning. What is Meld? And basically, it's a mechanic that lets you meld two cards together into one permanent. So Meld cards have a normal magic card front, but their back face is half of the combined permanent that they meld into. And even though it's represented by multiple cards, the melded permanent is considered to be a single permanent. So that means that it only takes one removal spell to get rid of it. And so that is... Uh, kind of indicative of the kind of stuff that you would be melding into. It's generally stuff that's pretty good uh, because in addition to the fact that you're basically asking yourself to get two for one, uh, you're also going to have to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to get your two specific uh, meldable cards together on the battlefield at the same time. Uh, permanents are the only thing that can be melded. In all zones other than the battlefield, they're considered separately and only the characteristics on the front face is going to consider uh, be visible to the game. So what do meld permanents look like? Well, here's an example. Uh, we got Urza, the Lord Protector, and he can meld together with the Might Stone and the Weak Stone, and together these turn into Urza, the Planeswalker. So this is actually split like right down the middle, and the, the top half is, is this card's back, and then the bottom half is this card's back. I believe it might be uh, actually the other way around, but people in the comments will for sure uh, tell me about that if I'm wrong. But that's basically what happens, is, is you, you have this and this both in play at the same time, you pay seven, and if you both own the Urza and the Might Stone and Weak Stone, then you would exile both of them, and then you would meld them together into Urza the Planeswalker, uh, and, and they that would mean you put them both back onto the battlefield with their back faces up, you know, representing this card here. So, yep, that is that is Meld. That's what Meld does. And I'm sure there's, you know, no no real crazy stuff going on with Meld, right? Like, it's pretty straightforward mechanic, right? I mean, what what could possibly go wrong? Well, we'll, we'll look at a couple potential things that might go wrong. So the first thing that's not super intuitive how it's supposed to work with Meld uh, would be Meld and Mana Value and also Mana Cost. Uh, so if you notice, none of the uh, extant cards that have Meld uh, have a Mana Cost up in the spot where you normally would expect to see it. Uh, so that would mean that even though the Graph Rats has a mana cost of one and a black and the Midnight Scavengers has a mana cost of four and a black, uh, the Chittering Host, which is what they meld together into, uh, actually has no mana cost at all. Uh, but it, it does have a mana value, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we have a game rule in the Comprehensive Rules that specifically defines that the back faces uh, of the constituent melded cards are considered together and added up into what the mana value of the, the front face is. And this is probably because we didn't want people to be able to like abrupt decay this chittering host after we went through all this trouble to be able to get it onto the battlefield. So that would mean um, if we had this, uh, uh, we've got a couple example questions here. So if we had this Mishra Lost to Phyrexia um, and we had the Essence Leak on it, well, if, if Enchanted Permanent is red or green, and, and check it out, it is, uh, it's it's red. So it has, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice this permanent unless you pay its mana cost. Now, as we were discussing in the previous slide, there is nothing here. So that means that there is no mana cost on this Mishra. So that means it would not be possible for you to pay its mana cost. And so, therefore, we would have to sacrifice it. That's the only legal way to perform this game instruction. So that's kind of uh, sad. Now, on the other hand... Uh, the, the Mishra Lost to Phyrexia is going to be pretty safe from Prismatic Endings for the foreseeable future. Unless they invent another couple of colors, uh, it's not going to be possible for you to, to play a Prismatic Ending against the Mishra Lost of Phyrexia. Uh, on the other hand, as we saw on, on the previous uh, slide where we were talking about the rules involved here, uh, if you were to clone a Mishra Lost of Phyrexia, then the clone just is defined by the game rules uh, to have a zero as its mana value. Uh, and so that would mean that the clone would be able to be taken out by Prismatic Ending for just one mana. Uh, and so that would mean that uh, there, there actually is like a, a pretty substantial difference between the, the original and the copy, which is kind of unusual because usually the copy copies pretty much everything. Uh, but in this case, that's, that's not actually how it would work. So um, 
the next topic that we're going to be talking about is meld and triggered abilities. And this is another one that's kind of a, a tricky, tricky one that we have to think carefully about. And the reason for that is because um, melded permanents uh, have two cards together as, as one permanent. Uh, and so that would mean that if you are looking at it as a permanent, it only counts as one permanent. But if you're looking at it as cards, uh, then it is considered to be two cards. And some triggered abilities uh, trigger based off of uh, each of those types of conditions. So you would need to read the triggered ability condition very carefully in order to be able to identify uh, whether we were working with a triggered ability that's going to trigger once because it looks at a permanent uh, changing zones or twice because it looks at a card changing zones. So to give you a little bit of practice about how uh, these types of triggered abilities might look. Uh, here's here's one that I prepared earlier. So let's say that we have the, the Chittering Host getting put into the graveyard, and uh, we'll look at the Fecundity one first. So with this triggered ability, it says whenever a creature dies, right? So this is one permanent, and therefore it's one creature. So that means that when this dies, uh, we're, we're getting one instance of this triggered ability. Um, now, if you remember from uh, a couple of slides ago, you might remember that both of the two cards that make up the Chittering Host are black on their front side, uh, which is kind of unusual because if you look at Chittering Host, it doesn't have a mana cost and it doesn't have a color indicator. Uh, so Chittering Host actually is a colorless permanent. Um, however, when we look at what Compost's triggered ability says, and we can read it very carefully, it says whenever a black card is put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere. So this is looking for cards to be put into the graveyard. And so how many cards were put into the graveyard? Well, two of them. And were they black? Yes, they were. Both of the cards that are in the graveyard are black. And so that means that if the Chittering Host dies, and then that would generate two compost triggers. So again, this is something that uh, I wish I could give you like an easy uh, way to, to look at it and think about it intuitively and it would make sense uh, without kind of resorting to the, the rules speak. Uh, as my first line of defense, but unfortunately, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, there really isn't. You have to you have to just read the triggered ability extremely carefully, uh, and, and you have to uh, you know interpret that in, in the lens of, of what's actually going on in the game in order to be able to uh, get the the correct answer for questions like these. So uh, next next thing is zone changes, and zone changes are also uh, a little bit potentially counterintuitive when you're dealing with these meld cards. Uh, so this is uh, one rule that's very important to be familiar with uh, in this sort of case. And I kind of uh, uh, like took out the, the parts that weren't relevant to the discussion that, that we're going to have here. But if an object is moving from one zone to another, we determine what event is moving the object. And if any effects or rules are trying to do two or more contradictory or mutually exclusive things to a particular object, then the controller of that object is, is going to be the one who chooses which effect to apply and what the effect does. Uh, and then that event moves the object. And there's another rule that I think it might be really helpful uh, to, to know. And uh, that says that if an effect is putting two or more cards into a specific position in a library at the same time, uh, then the owner of those cards uh, gets to put them in whatever order they want. Uh, and, and they do not have to reveal what that order was to any of the other players. Uh, so I, I guess uh, some of you could probably come up with a, a question where this rule might be uh, important. To, to know, but if, if you don't have that, that much creative uh, juice, then here, here it is. So uh, we're going to play, uh, Amy is going to play the Ether Gust against Nick's Titania. Uh, so what would happen? And so the first the first thing that we need to do is take a look at the, the Ether Gust uh, just to see exactly what it's instructing us to do. So Amy is going to choose target spell or permanent that's red or green. So of course this is a permanent, one permanent even though it's two cards and it is green, we can see a green color indicator here, so that means that we're good to go. Uh, its owner, uh, so that would be Nick in this case, is going to put it on top or bottom of his library. Okay, so uh, because Nick is the person who controls Titania, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, the object's controller, or its owner, if it has no controller, chooses what the uh, effect does. Right, so with that being the case, Nick would be the one who gets to choose whether it's putting on top or on bottom of his library. Uh, and uh, because it is Nick's library, uh, Nick is the owner of the cards that are getting put into the library, uh, that would also mean that he is the one who chooses uh, which order, like which of these two cards goes on the, the top and which one goes on the bottom. Uh, or, you know, 
as appropriate to, to what specific spot in his library that he's putting the Titania. So that is how the, the Ether Gust would, would affect the, the Titania. And of course, you can talk about in the comments uh, some of the, the repercussions that might happen if, for example, uh, Amy were to steal Nick's Titania, and then maybe Nick would play the Ether Gust against Titania. Um, and there, there's all kinds of interesting kind of sub questions that you could talk about there. But that's really, I think, kind of outside of the scope of what we're uh, really trying to, to do with this, which is give the like a, a introduction of I think the most common things that, that we might need to know. But based on the, the wording on those rules that you saw on the previous slide, you should be able to answer any questions of, of that sort also. So all right, another another kind of interesting thing uh, that, that would have to do with the, the meld mechanic and zone changes uh, would be would be a situation like this one here. So we've got Wheel of Sun and Moon, which says that if the Titania uh, dies, then uh, it would be put on the bottom of its owner's library. And then we've got the Rest in Peace that says if the Titania dies, then maybe we should actually exile it instead. So both of these are replacement effects. Um, and the, the rules surrounding this situation are, are pretty similar to the rules normally surrounding replacement effects. Uh, so if this was just like a Grizzly Bears, for example, we would only have one card to deal with, right? So the, the answer with the Grizzly Bears scenario is that the Grizzly Bears player would get to choose uh, whether the Grizzly Bears got exiled or their Grizzly Bears went onto the bottom of their owner's library. So, okay, um, you know, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but what, what would happen if we had the Titania? Well, it, it might be kind of tempting to think that maybe you could put one of them in the exile zone and then you'd put the other one on the bottom of your library. But it turns out that that's not possible. Um, the, the rules regarding uh, the meld cards is such that, that when you're making that choice, both of the halves of the meld permanent uh, are going to follow each other. So it's not going to be possible to have one exiled and one on bottom. Uh, you, you would have to put either both on bottom and again in an order determined by the owner of those cards. Uh, or you could put them both in the exile zone, but you could not split it up like that. So that's that's the answer to, to how that situation would work. Um, another another kind of interesting thing um, would be uh, the, this other kind of more specialized rule. So if a player exiles a melded permanent, then that player determines the relative timestamp order of the two cards at that time. Uh, this is an exception to the procedure described in this rule, which basically says that ordinarily, if two cards are getting exiled at the same time, then the person who owns those two cards would be the one who says uh, which which order the, the, the timestamps happen. And so um, we'll, we'll come up with an example for, for why that rule might be important uh, on the next slide here. Uh, but we also have this other rule that, that's also going to be potentially important for us, which says that if an effect can find the new object that a melded permanent becomes as it leaves the battlefield, then it finds both of the cards. Um, and if an effect causes actions to be taken on those cards, the same actions are taken on both of them. So let's see what that might mean in the context of this example here involving a, a duplicate. So if we have the Chittering Host uh, on the battlefield, um, on Nick, Nick's side of the battlefield, and then Amy plays the duplicate against Nick's Chittering Host, uh, the rules say that Amy, because Amy is the one who is instructed to exile the Chittering Host, is the one who decides what the relative timestamp of the two constituent halves of Cheering Host uh, being exiled would be. And so that's important because what it says on Duplicant is as long as a creature card is exiled with it, then it has the power, toughness, and creature types of the last creature card exiled with Duplicant. Uh, so that would mean that Amy is the one who would get to make the choice of which of the two parts of Chittering Host the, the duplicate would get the values of because she's the one who would get to say which one is considered to be exiled first and last even though of course they actually physically enter the exile zone at the same time. The timestamps that they are given are actually um, you know decided by Amy because Amy's the person who controls the the thing that exiles them. So okay that's there's that uh, and then then we also see that a little bit of that other rule that we talked about uh, coming into play because um, if we exiled a, a card um, we're, we're only instructed to exile target non-token creature, so we're, we're only instructed to exile one thing. Uh, but uh, because we exile it and then do an action or have access to the ability to, to see that, that card that we exiled, um, we are able to see both of them. So even though it only looks at the creature types of the last uh, creature card exiled with duplicate um, and all the other stuff, 
it, it still does know that there are two cards that are exiled with it. And and the, the second one being the creature card uh, is the, the one that it looks at. So a little bit more concrete of an example of that second rule would be with this card, Mimic Bat, here. So what this says is whenever a non-token creature dies, you can exile that card. So, so therefore, um, th this triggered ability uh, tracks it when it does a zone change, and then it can find and do an action on the, the card. So because of that rule that we had, uh, we know that it can find both halves of the, the Cheering Host, the, the Graph Rats and the Midnight Scavengers, uh, and exile both of them. So both of these cards would be getting exiled. And with that being the case, um, we, we have this ability here that says create a token that's a copy of a card exiled with Mimic Bat. Uh, so you don't get both of them. You actually would only get uh, whichever one you choose uh, as the Mimic Bat player. Uh, but, but they would both be exiled because of uh, this ability here and the, the rule that we had talked about on, on the slide uh, a couple of slides ago. So that, that is meld and zone changes. And then um, how does meld work with stuff that's uh, not meld? Well, not very good. Uh, this is what I call the fun police rule. Uh, only two cards belong to the same meld pair can be melded together. Um, so if you have a token or if you have something that is not a meld card, maybe it's a copy of a meld card or another card that acquired the same name as a meld card, uh, or a meld card and another meld card that doesn't happen to be the, the corresponding meld card for its meld pair. Uh, those sorts of things cannot be melded together. It is not legal for you to do a game instruction to meld a token or a card that isn't a meld card or two cards that are not the same meld pair. Uh, and there is a rule where it says all the, the meld pairs in the comprehensive rules. So if an in, uh, if in effect instructs a player to meld objects that can't be melded together, they stay in their current zone. So uh, if you notice, all of the, the meld cards say to exile them and then meld them together. Well, guess what? Uh, you can exile them just fine. You just can't meld them together. And so that that is uh, what would happen if you were trying to uh, you know clone a uh, graph rats and then meld that cloned graph rats together with the midnight scavenger it would not work uh, and in fact it would end up being very ugly for you as, as the, the like mad scientist player here who's trying to do that um so that that's that's the way that the meld would work in those sorts of situations uh and then here's some some like kind of random stuff about how meld would work with other mechanics so it might be physically similar to uh double-faced cards um or or even like you know morph cards where you can turn them face down uh, but it's mechanically distinct it's actually a completely separate mechanic with completely separate rules uh and because of that meld cards cannot transform uh, they cannot be turned face down. So if you have a meld card that is on the battlefield, um, so th that would be uh, referring to either uh, the, the combined melded permanent that's the back face of both of them, or even if you have just like a graph rats by itself, um, that card cannot transform. Um, and it also cannot be turned face down. So if you are instructed to do so, you would just not do that action. Uh, however, it is possible to get uh, meld cards onto the battlefield face down or cast them face down. Uh, and there are some specific cards that allow you to do that. Um, it works exactly the same way as double-faced cards if, if you are instructed to do something like that, uh, which is you would just put it face down onto the battlefield um, and you wouldn't tell anybody that's uh, actually a meld card. Uh, but if it you know gets turned face up, then it you know you can see that it's a meld card and, and it just works the same way a normal meld card on the battlefield would work from that point on. Uh, when you're choosing a card name, uh, if you want to choose the back, like the combined card name of the two meld creatures, uh, that is possible. You can choose either of the names of the, the two you know, things that meld together into it, or you can choose the combined name of the total melded permanent. Uh, all of those are valid choices for a card name if you are asked to choose a card name. Uh, so, for example, if you had a Pithing Needle, then that could really put the hurt on Urza the Planeswalker uh, because uh, then you would not be able to activate any of its Planeswalker loyalty abilities. So, uh, finally, there uh, is, is one other thing that I wanted to talk about, which is the, the Commander variant, and there are some Commander-specific things that you might be uh, interested to know about Meld. Uh, so, your Commander can be a card. You get a Commander, um, and so that means Brizella here could not be your commander. Uh, Bruna could, or Gisela uh, could be, but not the, the both of them together as represented by this card. Uh, if your commander is half of a melded pair on the battlefield, so if Bruna was your commander, 
and you controlled uh, Gisela and you melded them together, then that would mean that this Brizella is actually got the attribute of being your commander. Uh, so any damage that it dealt would be considered to be uh, commander damage. Um, so coming from a commander source, uh, because you know if, if half of this is your commander, then it's your commander. That's that's how that works. Uh, and even though we have a rule that says that if both cards of a meld pair are leaving the battlefield, they're supposed to go to the same zone. Uh, if one of the cards in the meld pair is your commander, uh, then you can bypass that rule and put it into the command zone. So uh, that is an exception to the the thing that I said earlier, where if you have a zone change involving a, a two two permanents melded together, uh, then you would have to put them both into the same zone. This is this is an exception to that, and it would mean that you could put the the commander the one that was a commander into the command zone. The other one would of course be going to the the zone as normal. Uh, and so that's that's about it. That I think should cover pretty much all of the situations that I could come up with that I thought were likely to come up with, uh, you know, come up in a, a normal game of Magic. Uh, if you have any other questions about how Meld works or how Meld interacts with any of the various other mechanics in Magic, uh, definitely leave them down in the comments and I'll do my best to, to answer those questions um, that, that you leave there. Uh, but that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for another Daily Ruling. But until then, I hope you have a great day.